Conduit Bridge on the Bristol and North Somerset Abandoned Railway. And there's something below us right now that's really rare for this country. Come and take a look. There are two things that have troubled me about railway gauges over the years, but I've never really taken the time to understand them. We know that today's modern railway gauges did not evolve from a Roman chariot and subsequent horse's rear. I'll clear that up shortly if you missed a prior video. So why exactly do we have a 4 foot 8.5 inch railway gauge in this country, the UK? And number two, it said that the wider the gauge, or the greater the speed and efficiency and stability. So why did Brunel's seven foot broad gauge fail? Welcome to the short history of the railway gauge. And of course, here we are. Quite the rare thing for this country to find some in situ track in a hedge that wasn't pulled up and reused in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So when we talk about the gauge of a railway, we're talking about the inside, the top of the rail heads to each other. We're not talking about the middle, the outside, the sleepers, and they shouldn't be confused with the loading gauge. Whole different subject, we'll come to that later. So railways here in the UK have what we call a standard gauge, four foot eight and a half inches or 1,435 millimeters. Now they didn't start out like that, despite the vast majority or a good percentage of the world's gauges being exactly that. To find out what happened, let's step back 500 years or so. When you start researching early railways, there is a rabbit hole and a half, and I have no intention of going down that to answer my two questions. Suffice to say, there is much evidence that discusses cart ruts from Greece to Roman mines. They all imply early railways, but we are talking rail ways not ruts. So let's keep on the rails. And for that, we need to head to Cumbria. So my budget doesn't quite stretch to uh, Cumbria for this video and perhaps more importantly my apathy to travel there in late cold December is fairly high. However, instead we've now travelled a bit further to the uh, east on the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton Railway to show you a few different types of rails that may or may not be hidden in the hedge and of course go on and really enjoyable railway walk which I haven't done for quite some time. Cumbria 1560s and the company of the Mines Royale utilising German and Austrian miners introduced a wagonway. Now it probably wasn't the first but it's one of the first documented. In fact Agricola documented similar wagonways in his works De Re Metallica. The system used wooden planks and rails with wooden wheels. No flange in any way. The rails were pinned to each other so as not to widen. It sounds a bit like chaos. So these rails for mines popped up all over Europe. So was there a need for them to conform to one another, for them to be monitored in some way? Well, of course not. They were serving their own purpose within their own minds. Job done. By the 1750s and 60s, iron production was increasing hugely and the need to increase efficiency and the way things were moved and transported was paramount. Plateways were the next big thing emerging in the late 1700s. This system would allow unflanged wheels to run on L-shaped metal plateways. Now we're almost stepping back into the cart rut territory here. So let's step forward and introduce perhaps one of the most important characters of the day. Now in walking this abandoned railway, I did promise you I'd better show you some bits of infrastructure and maybe some old rails relevant to this line. 
nothing as yet but however it has given us a spectacular view ahead almost like a holloway carved straight ahead of me as far as the eye can see a tiny speck of light in the distance really beautiful really relaxing let's get back on the story let's head to the north of england more specifically the northeast of england this area in particular is hugely important for the development and the technology behind these early rails and perhaps even more importantly than that it's a playground for the likes of stevenson to build on this technology and he did just that Killingworth Tramway was one such example and was where Stevenson's edge rail design was now being used in favour of the old plateway, the edge rail being this. The modern rail relied on flanged wheels. Now those original plateways were five foot wide, a nice round measurement. The plates themselves were around four inches wide. So when designing his edge rails, four foot eight inches seemed a perfectly good measure to carry on using those wagons with a slight modification. And thus we have the four foot eight inch gauge. Hang on a second, so where did the four foot eight and a half inch come from? Well, according to the map, there's a uh, lot of water either side here. So I think if I head down this little pathway, I may or may not find an old culvert and some architecture of some kind. Now, Stevenson at this point was soon contracted to build two new railways. The, uh, the famous Liverpool and Manchester and the not so famous Bolton and Lee. Both of these rails and gauge were specified at four foot eight, not eight and a half. All right, well there is no culvert here, but there is something relevant to the video. Have a look at this. This is used as the uh, upright stanchion of the fencing all the way along this route. And I feel like this is the original broad gauge, maybe when they ripped it up all over the network eventually, or well, this is what they did with it. They used it as a, uh, various points of fencing. But Stevenson wasn't completely happy as the stock on the curve appeared to bind somewhat. He increased the distance on the gauge by half of an inch which solved this seemingly with no stability issues. At a point during the gauge wars period Stevenson was asked why the four foot eight inches his reply almost certainly in itself quashes the myth of the Roman gauge being adopted. If I had only been called upon to do so, it would be difficult to give good reason for the adoption of the odd measure. Four foot, eight and a half inches. The gauge really was an evolution of his own, not one of over 2,000 years old. The gauges did evolve all around the world in their own right, their own evolution, and certainly exports from Britain in those very early days, the mid 1800s, well that did lead to the four foot eight and a half inch being quite significant around the globe. But a lot of those other gauges did remain, and they remained even within their own country and own variations. Just take a look at Australia, quite the thing. Not only that, but even within Britain, Scottish railway engineer misread some of the early documents on the Stockton and Darlington and assumed the four foot eight was from the middle of the head of the rail. Subsequently for a time, his gauge was in fact four foot six inches. And of course, here in the south of England, we have Isambard Kingdom Brunel leading the charge on his great western railway linking the, uh, the London to Bristol. Now, he truly believed in efficiency. And here we have another opportunity to try and find an old culvert and some infrastructure as the path goes down the side of this quite big embankment here on the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton Railway. Now perhaps because he didn't have the early influence of the mines from the northwest, maybe he thought outside of that world he chose the seven foot gauge over two foot wider than Stevenson's now adopted gauge. Seven foot or just over would give greater speed, stability and efficiency. So why ever didn't that last? Once again, no culvert, a bit frustrating. 
I thought we'd see something there. But again, we've got some more rail and we've got beautiful old fence that lined the railway here. I love that, the old wires that link them. The pioneers of the time, all busy building and insisting that their technology was the best, had little idea of the overall picture it seemed. They didn't really foresee at this early stage a need for a joined up thinking and why would they? Brunel's goal was the States via his steam boats. He connected London to Bristol, possibly for that reason. But as time went on, well, railways cropped up everywhere. They linked every community imaginable. If you didn't have a railway in your village, you were extremely unlucky. And of course, what that meant is railways became closer to one another. And the gauges, well, of course, they wouldn't mix together. So we had to have transfer stations like Didcot and Chard where the lines met. And of course, you'd have to disembark or you'd have to move freight. One last ditch attempt to show you a culvert on this uh, this railway and uh, I feel like there's one just down here getting there isn't quite so easy not because of the embankment as such but more the water at the bottom but I think just down there is what I wanted to show you quite a way Um, found it. I had to leave my other camera behind because it got too sketchy, but found the culvert quite significant as well. This is going to be something else. It's going to take a quick look before we uh, get back on the story. Structurally, seen a lot better days. All this original outside has been reconcreted, uh, but four or five foot in or whatever, it's uh, back to its original brick lined. Don't think it's going anywhere. Um, but it does give us a bit of context on um, what a culvert under this huge embankment looks like. And I've just got to clamber back up the top without falling back down again. In steps the Royal Commission for Railway Gauges in 1845 and the result is the Regulating of Railway Gauges Act 1846. Now owing to the fact that Stevenson's gauge had almost over eight times more track laid, well that decision was clear, the four foot eight and a half inches would stick. By moving forward we mean that there was no expectation that Brunel and others had to rip up their track overnight. But Brunel did so anyway, and within 20 or so years, they started then converting every single line to standard gauge. Now, when they did that, they did that in style. Oxford to Tame line, which is quite some distance. Well, that took just a few days to convert the entire line. It's said that the cost of change from broad to standard gauge was around about £800,000 at the time. That's something like £108 billion in today's money. It's quite some significant outlay. And at the, uh, at the time, 1891, it was reported by the Times that it had been a failure. Uh, economically, commercially, whichever way you want to read into it. Which seems a bit strange on the face of it because perhaps had uh, th that gauge been more prolific in its early days, well maybe that would have been adopted everywhere and the world would look like a very different place, but for the meantime we will probably never know. It's a what if of the age old infrastructure tales. And if you've enjoyed these tales, well please feel free to join us every week and click on the subscribe button below for more interesting things that just fall into my head and come out in the form of a video. Uh, thanks for watching. See you next time.